Hey folks, how you doing? Uh, Troy Redfern here. Hope you guys are all keeping well uh, and staying safe in these sort of very strange times. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank Will for uh, for asking me to do this uh, little interview. Um, he sent me some questions um, just about what, been, what I've been up to and whatnot. Um, so we'll go through them. I'm going to play a couple of tunes as well, I think. Uh, right, let's have a look at the first one. Right, first things first. How are you and your family coping with this lockdown in this crazy, unprecedented situation we find ourselves in? Well, it's, it's really strange for everyone at the minute, you know. Um, it's not been too bad here because we're sort of so far out of the way up in Paris um, on the Welsh border. Um, There's been a few cases, but it's not been anything like um, in the cities and whatnot. So, uh, so it's, yes, it's been strange um, being locked down, you know, and um, just dealing with that situation and not getting out and you know, bizarre going to the supermarket sort of masked up and gloved um, um, but you know, besides that it's not been hard I don't know anyone personally who's, who's been affected um, yet um, so we've had it you know I've had it quite easy um, um, it's just given me time to uh, to come and to, to, you know, use the time creatively and get some stuff done um, I think sleep patterns, I was talking to Mike Ross about this the other day, uh, um, that's the only thing I think, sleep patterns have changed, um, a little bit of insomnia, um, but besides that, not too bad, um, yeah, everything, everything is good at the minute. So let's look, question two, you seem to have not just sat around during this lockdown, but instead embraced it and created more of an online presence. Was that a conscious thing from you, as, as soon as you realised you wouldn't be able to be out there gigging for the foreseeable future? Um, I think um, what happened, as soon as um, the lockdown um, happened, um, Jason Elliott um, got in touch, he, he got on the, uh, he was one of, I think, the first person to do one of the lockdown festivals, and he contacted me, asking if I'd be a, a part of that. Um, so that was the first live stream, so that was through uh, Jason, really. Um, and then I've done another one since. I'm probably going to do another one. Um, I didn't want to do too many in a row. I think people get bored if you if you start doing loads of live streams. Um, so I wanted to space them out a little bit. Um, so yeah, it wasn't a conscious effort really. It was uh, it was more through Jason. Um, you know, he was, he was really on it. They got it together. He did an absolutely fantastic job. Um, you know, it was a, it was a success, and he did another couple after that. And uh, yeah, it's brilliant to be involved with it. It's definitely sort of out of the comfort zone because, you know, even now talking into a phone, it's a really strange thing to do, to, you know, talking to the void. Um, but it was good. It, it put me out of my comfort zone. And, um, yeah, I enjoy doing it. You know, it's quite stressful. But once it was done, it was, it was great. Uh, right. So question three is, before the lockdown, you were doing some shows supporting Willie and the Bandits. How was that? Um, that was absolutely fantastic. It was it was a really good run of dates. I think we did three weeks with them. Um, uh, went through uh, Midlands and sort of up to Scotland, um, and there were some absolutely cracking shows. You know, because um, we were the support band, and and as a support band, you're you're playing to the headliners' audience really. So you're having to try your best to win over that crowd every night. So we played hard and. Uh, Gave it everything every night, and um, it was great. You know, when Willie was fantastic, well, the whole band were. Mm. You know, headliners, so, you know, do their sound check first and um, put all their stuff on the stage, and they were really considerate. They left lots of space for us. Um, Finn, the drummer, let um, Luke use his drum kit, which is great because normally the support band has to put their drum kit in front of the the headline band, which is a nightmare, and that would have you know, just given, given us no space. So, they, you know, that was perfect. Um, and they were just a great bunch of guys to be with. Um, we had a really good good laugh with those guys. They're, you know, they're, they're all of them. They're all fantastic. Uh, so it was brilliant. It was a shame that, you know, we had another three weeks to go. It was a six-week six week tour. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, um, safety is more important, you know. Um, and um, it's been rescheduled for... Uh, 
the back end of the year. So um, hopefully that'll happen. I'm not sure, you know, I don't think anyone's sure what's going to happen. Um, but fingers crossed, you know, we'll be back out with them um, back end of the year. So keep, um, you know, stay tuned for, for posts on that one. Right then, uh, question four is, I noticed you seem to have acquired half of Hell's Gazelles as your band for this tour. How did that come about? Well, when I got the, um, the initial call, um, it was a, a message from um, Willie and the Bandit's agent. Um, and they were, uh, Matt um, contacted me and asked me if I was interested in, in doing the tour. There was six weeks of dates that were given and uh, he said, you know, are you interested? But he wanted to know immediately, you know, it was like a, something you need to know like ASAP. So I got in touch with the guys that I um, normally gig with, um, Adam and Jack, and um, they both work and six weeks is a long time on the road, you know, um, and they couldn't do it, they just couldn't do that. So, and I really wanted to do the gig, you know, this is a great opportunity, um, you know, great shows, great venues. So it was, it was kind of really important that, that I did it. So I got in touch with Penny Lee, who's a good friend, and it also sort of promotes the Bullingdon over in Oxford. <clears throat> I'm sure you guys uh, have heard of Penny, or well, know Penny. And um, got in touch with her and said about the situation that it doesn't look like I'm gonna be able to do it because, you know, I can't get anyone to uh, get, you know, rhythm section to play. And, and then she said, leave it with me. And uh, within, I don't know, a few hours maybe, she got back and, um, She'd find Luke and Barney, a drummer and bass player from Hell's Gazelles, and uh, they said they were up for it, and they came out on the roads. Um, so it was lucky because if they hadn't have been able to do it, uh, that tour wouldn't have, for me that tour wouldn't have happened. Um, I did. So there was some talk about me going out by myself, but it, it's not really my comfort zone. I'm a, a band player, really. I can do solo shows, but I prefer to sort of the energy of a of a full band show. So. Right then, you released an album earlier this year called This Raging Heart, but it was only in limited format. What was the reasoning behind that, as it's a really very good album? Well, when I got the, the call about doing the tour, um, there was a, you know, quite a run of dates. I figured I needed something to, to sell and promote on that tour. And the last thing I'd put out was 18 months, two years before, so I, you know, um, I figured that I need to get something together really quick. And um, I think I've spoken to Mike Ross and Mike for booting me in the ass and said, get something together. Um, mm. And because I, um, I've got a studio set up at home, I do a lot of my own recording anyhow. Um, all the releases I put out up until the one that's coming out next year have been recorded in my own little studio. Um, I got plenty of music that was written and recorded and, and finished and shelved. I got two albums worth of stuff um, that was ready to go. So I just went through that, that material, mm. picked ten, 10 songs and um, about 18 months, probably when I wrote that material, I'd, uh, I got a guy called Vince Ray to do some artwork for me. And um, and he'd sent the artwork through, and it was great. And I, but I just shelved it because there was there wasn't a project for that artwork at the time. So I decided to to go with that artwork. Um, I got a guy called Sam Hales from Dose Prod to to um, get the package done for me, and um, and put it out. Um, but I didn't want to put lots of time and energy into promoting it because you know normally when you release an album you sort of put it out three months before it's released to the magazines and, and get reviews and whatnot and that wasn't really the point with that you know I want to do that next year with the, the um, Rockfield album um, so this one was just like a quick one to get out to take something on the road to sell for merch um, and we got t-shirts done and all that kind of thing so it was, it was a really, we had a really good merch done this time um, and that sold really well and it's you know been received really well so that's that's great so that's that's the story with that album mm. question six i know you've been working hard on a new studio album how has that been going well at the minute i'll talk about that album but um i put that on pause for a, for a few weeks 
the plan was to um, to start tracking or well, retracking guitars and vocals over this um, few months because the plan was to release it in September. Um, but given the current situation, you know, there's, there's, I, I can't see the point in releasing it during the lockdown or until this is at least sort of like yeah, this is let up a bit. Um, it seems crazy. I need to tour it really. Um, so what I decided to do was um, put that on pause and um, and start. Probably about two weeks ago, I started recording an album of music that's just of now, you know, of, of during the lockdown. Um, so I start with a clean slate and um, yeah, I've been working on that. I've pretty much done it like this 10 tracks. Um, the artwork's done. Aaron Gardner has done the artwork for that. The album's called Island. Um, and it's a little bit different. Um, you know, what I wanted to do with it was to have some kind of have some freedom creatively to do things that I might not do in a, in a different, you know, in, in like in the studio environment or, you know, a, a normal, you know, like I went up to Rockfield, they were just songs and they were very specific. And um, this group of songs has, has allowed me to be a bit more creative and a bit freer. Um, um, there's some instrumental tunes on there that, uh, you know, guitar music, that are not particularly blues not particularly rock even so I think it's quite interesting it's quite an interesting mix of um, of ideas but it's a it's a it's a snapshot of this last few weeks in lockdown really and I'm really pleased with it like last night I uh, I finished the last track off and I listened back to the to the rough mixes that I've done and um, yeah, I was really pleased it's just it's an interesting um, interest now I think I'm hoping people like it once I finish recording this I'm gonna do a little video for one of the songs I've done one cover on there so we'll, we'll be putting I'll be putting that out um, in a few weeks time um, so I'll, I'll promote that I'll do a few little videos for that one and uh, I'm not sure whether to um, I was gonna, the, the initial thing was to put it on Bandcamp but I think I may make some physical copies maybe make 100 or something and see how that goes um, but going back to the to the Rockfield album that that um, Will was talking about. Um, that stuff was written last year. Uh, I went down to Brighton and um, tracked some of that stuff, and I wasn't really happy with the results. You know, it wasn't the right sound and the right vibe. So I sort of scrapped that session. And um, when I was in Poland last September, I bumped into. Um, uh, well, it was with Dudley's band, uh, Darby Todd, the drummer. Um, he was there, and I had a good chat with him. And I, I knew Darby's work. Darby's an absolutely great drummer. He plays with uh, like Justin Hawkins from The Darkness, and he's done Robin Ford stuff, Paul Gilbert stuff. You know, just tons of names. So he's just an absolutely rock solid drummer and a great guy. And um, we spoke, and it's one of those things you bump into musicians and you say about doing stuff with them, and generally that sort of doesn't happen, but. I thought, right, what I need to do is get this album, this next one, done properly. Get the best players I can possibly get to, to play on it. Um, so Derby, I got in touch with Derby, gave the dates, booked Rockfield up, and um, and yeah. Uh, and he suggested getting in touch with um, Dave Marks, who he plays with, a bass player who's off the scale good. I don't know if, if any of you know of his work, but you know, Google him. Dave Marks on Facebook or whatnot, and he's just, you know, he's, he's an unusual player. He's just rock solid. He can do all the technical stuff. He can play all the Billy Sheehan stuff. He can play all the slap stuff, you know, all the crazy stuff you want. But he also understands what a song needs. So some of the demos I've done for this material, some of it, um, I'd use plectrum bass, um, which some bass players get a bit snobby about that. You know, there's this big thing about using sort of fingers to play bass, you know, it's this weird thing. But he got it, you know, he understood the attack of a, of a pick, you know, there was no question that there was no sort of, he, he, he didn't care, you know, it was just, yeah, the track needs it and we do it. So, so anyway, we went to, um, went to Rockfield for a couple of days and, you know, you're putting up a lot of money for things like that, you know, um, for hiring people and, and the studio. So it's a big risk, you know, that you're just hoping the results are going to be good. And 
I was absolutely blown away by the uh, by the results, the, the playbacks of just the tracks unmixed through you know, through the consoles or through the monitors it was just off the scale good. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking forward to that when that actually. Um, so I think what I'll do is once now these ten tracks for this island album are done, I can slowly start uh, putting that together um, and just take my time and get it right, get it nailed. Um, spend a lot of time with, with guitar tones, getting you know, because that's <coughs> such a key ingredient <coughs> with the mix. It's getting the right guitar sound because um, that sort of defines the genre and the style. So, so that yeah, that's what I'm going to be on um, next. Um, question seven is a little bird, a birdie tells me that there may be a special guest appearance as well on the album. Are you allowed to talk about that? Um, yep, I think I mentioned it. Um, during the second live stream, um, the same time that I met Derby in Poland at the Sato Blues Festival, um, we uh, we played. I think we were playing on the on the Sunday, and uh, but we went down the, on the uh, on the on the where well, we played the Sunday. We hung around on the Saturday and. Uh, and I bumped into uh, Ron Thal, Bumblefoot. Uh, you know, some of you guitar player guys might know of him. Um, he was in uh, Guns N' Roses for, I think it was eight, eight years, six or eight years, he was in Guns N' Roses, and he plays with Sons of Apollo. And uh, he's just a next level guitar player. He's just, you know, he's in that bracket of like, you know, Vi, Satriani, all that, you know, those amazing sort of technical players. But, he, you know, he uses a double neck guitar with one's fretless, which sounds very slide-like. And, uh, and actually, that night he let me um, he let me use that guitar. Um, he, uh, we went out on an encore, and uh, and uh, yeah, he was just a, a really really nice guy. Just no bullshit, no um, no pretentiousness. Um, just a really sort of cool person. So after that, um, I thought I'd give him a. Give him a call and um, and ask him if he wanted to put a, a solo on on the album, and he's called. He, he said, "Yep," and uh, he sent it through, and it's just crazy good. You know, it's, it's just perfect. Um, so um, that'll be on a track called "On Fire." Um, so I've got the guitar solo for that all ready to go. Um, so yeah, so I'm really excited to have him on there because you know he's just like he's a phenomenal player, and it'll just really enhance that track. So. And it's, a, it's a rock track, you know. The, in fact, most of that Rockfield album um, is going to be kind of like more leaning towards the rock side of things than the blues. It's still blues based. Um, it's still got that flavour, but it's going to be heavier. You know, Darby's playing is heavier on the drums, so it's going to be kick ass. Uh, right then. Right, question eight. Let's talk guitars. I'm sure one of your favourite subjects. Now let's start with resonators. What's your current model and what makes it special? Well, here it is. This is a 1929 National Triolian. I think you can see it there. Um, and, and all these vintage guitars, you know, there's, there's definitely something special about them. Um, about the tone of the of, of the older nationals, you know, um, and that's why they're so, so sought after, I guess. Um, I've been after one like this for years. Uh, mm. I'd um, the story behind this is, um, yeah, you know, eBay, you know, I've got it in my search sort of list for for nationals to, when they come up, and and in reverb and all those kind of things, those guitar. You know, websites and um, this one came up and um, I saw it and I just you know, couldn't believe it I just I just thought what can I sell to uh, what guitars can I sell to to get this and um, I remember telling Emma my girlfriend um, about this guitar that I'd seen I was gonna sell some guitars and blah 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 and uh, and the next day I went to look at it, you know, I kept going back to the site to look at it and they're gone. And I'm just, oh, for God, you know, 
you can look for something like, you know, if you're looking for a very specific guitar, they don't come up very often. And um, if you miss that chance, then generally they're gone. You know, that's it. You won't, you won't, it'll always take a long time to find another one. Um, so I was really pissed off. <laughs> mm. And then uh, that was, I can't remember what month that was, but anyway, my birthday was probably four or five weeks later. And um, so my birthday, uh, Emma um, made me close my eyes, brought a box down, wrapped up, I, um, opened it up and it was this. And I uh, absolutely couldn't believe it. I was just absolutely blown away. And so that's this, the story behind this resonator. But, you know, it's just, it's just super solid. I love the wear on it. Um, I love the tone of it. Um, it's just perfect. So I'd say this is probably one of my favorite guitars. Um, when I got it, mm, it was a maple fretboard, which I wasn't really keen on. Um, they're kind of like maples, like a pale wood. And um, I did some research mm, and found that it wasn't the original one. It had been replaced at some point. Um, so I got someone to put an uh, ebony board on, which uh, you know I much prefer the, the darker wood. Um, and yeah, that's that. I use um, a Barkersbury pickup. Um, because I play electric and I plug this into my amp to my normal rig um, so it sounds like a you know, detuned guitar because it's in C mm. what else it holds tune really well they're just solid as a rock you know you'd think something this old from 1929 would be fragile but they're just you know, it's, it's a bit like a tank and um, you know I took this out and I've taken it on the road to get out the Willie Bandits tour um, um. You know, just gonna keep your eye on it. That's the main thing when you're taking some vintage guitar around. You know, so sort of, I, I had it with me sort of every second. Um, but yeah, absolutely love it. Um, perfect guitar, one I'd never sell or get rid of. Not only for the sentimental value, but just because it's you know, hundred percent my favorite guitar. Right then, staying with guitars, you play silver tone and Fenders on stage. What's your go-to guitar, or do they all have their own purposes in a set? Well, I take probably about six guitars out with me, unfortunately, when I gig, um, and that's because I write on different guitars, and they've, they've all got different tunings, different string gauges, <clears throat> um, so you can't really just do everything on one guitar or two guitars. Um, I could really learn this out, I suppose, but... Um, mm. I take a Gibson Les Paul out of me, I've got a gold top from back 2001 and that's uh, like a custom shop, the historic 57 reissue and um, I absolutely love that guitar, it's just really solid and, and the pickups, the sounds are, you know, the pickups are really fat and um, I played a lot of Les Pauls and that's the, the, the one, the, 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 the best Les Paul I played, um, luckily I got that. Um, the silver tone is, you know, is perfect for slide. The the um, those silver foil pickups are just really raw and dirty, and it just really suits that style and and my style of playing. Um, you know, there's lots of talk at the minute about gold foil pickups. They're really good, you know, and, and silver foils are like those are just high output, but they're really open in the way that you can hear the strings through the pickup. You know, if you get like an EMG pickup. Mm. You can lose a string definition when you play that chord and just become like a sine wave, just a fat sound. But with with those um, those silver foil pickups, you can still hear the pick, you know hear the strings. Um, so yeah, uh, that's great. The Fenders, um, I take two Fenders out with me. I've got a silver American. Um, it was a Texas Special originally, I think. Um, and I take um, I've got an old Mexican. Uh, a sonic blue Mexican strap. Um, they both got pickups. Um, my uncle wound me some sc uh, hand scatter wound me uh, two sets of pickups, um, and they're five point three k, so they're quite low output. Um, and I've got I think the gauge on the silver one. I got thirteens cranked up to uh, A. It's like a G tuning, but higher. So it's, it's really taut and it's great for slide and um, those flat wounds on that one. And um, 
the other fender I use is in standard tuning but in C sharp um, and they just all you know they've all got their own personality um, all the pickups uh, give a give a flavor so a certain song will require you know a certain sound and um, that's why you know, another reason despite the tunings is that, that they've just got a different thing going on but I don't, I don't think I've got a go-to mm. I would say the silver tone is probably my favorite um, electric for slide and the Les Paul probably for standard those two guitars you know if ever I do any gigs abroad and I have to take two if I have to take two guitars um, it's, it's definitely the silver tone mm. and sometimes maybe a fender because you know if it's an airline thing you don't want you you know but Les Paul's quite fragile the sort of you know they like to sort of break the headstock or something so I'd take the fenders because they're bulletproof um, cool Another extension of your playing is the use of bottleneck slide. Can you tell us a little bit more about them, please? Yep. So, I've got two of them here. Um, so yeah, these are glass slides. They're hand blown um, by a company called Diamond Bottlenecks. Um, this guy called Ian McWee, who supplies these. And uh, Ian's a great chap. And uh, I was lucky enough to be asked to uh, it's gone border those guys with the signature model so this is this is one of my own signature um, models this one's my favorite um, got this red one here uh, which is got this little section here which fits on so you think really nicely but they're, they're really thick walled glass slides and um, I've used all sorts of these pyrex and these brass ones over the years but 100% there's, there's nothing like these you know, the tone is thick um, the weight is perfect you know, personally I like a nice thick wall uh, the Pyrex things are sort of like you know, too light for me I like the, for, for, for vibrato um, I love I like some weight and um, so yeah these things are perfect so diamond bottlenecks if you're thinking about playing slide you know two things you know get some thick strings and crank them up so they're nice and tight so it doesn't clank around on the uh, on the frets and get yourself a, a decent slide. Um, so yeah, um, I think that came about. I, I went to to Ian's uh, workshop to his shop, and uh, it was on my birthday. I went to get a slide, so I drove down there, and uh, I was choosing a slide. And he and he said, uh, "How do you fancy coming on board?" And I was absolutely blown away to have you know. To have a signature model because you know people like Martin Offler and sort of guys like that on on the on the, uh, on the signatures all page. So, uh, so yeah, I was absolutely honoured to be part of their you know, roster. So yeah, done with bottlenecks.
We saw your son join you on stage, I believe last year. How was that? And was it a pride papa moment? Yeah, it was. It was re it was really good. Um, he, he played at two festivals. He played at um, Upton and Linton. He played, um, I think he played Linton first. And uh, I've been teaching Logan to play guitar, you know, for a little while. I've not been sort of too heavy with it, you know, I don't want to be like a pushy sort of like parent, you know. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I wanted to inspire him, you know, to, to do stuff, you know, because it's a great thing, you know, for kids to sort of play music. Um, so it's a fine sort of balance really between sort of, you know, um, keeping someone interested and inspired and not being too pushy with it, you know. Uh, and uh, and the way I look at it, you know, once you've done a gig or you've done a show you, or you've done anything really, you know, it's, it's a memory. And that's, I think that the reason I wanted him to play was because when he's older, you know, sort of when he's a man and um, you know, when I'm when I'm gone or whatever, you know, he'll have that memory in his, you know, um, so even if he don't, doesn't carry on with guitar playing, I think that's a great memory to have. And uh, that was my motivation behind, you know, him getting up to do that. Um, uh, and for him to feel that on stage, you know, to feel that, what to share that kind of feeling of that energy. And, um, and Linton was really good. He, he got a good reception. People liked it. He got, you know, the crowd came forward for him. And uh, and Upton was a was a, you know, a huge audience. And um, and he loved it. You know, he absolutely he absolutely loved playing. And uh, he wants to do some more stuff. The only thing is because he's, he's quite young, he's not really into travelling. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't like long car journeys. Um, so they they were quite local to me. You know, that the Linton and Upton are fairly sort of close. Hour, hour and a half or something, so that was fine. But um, but he's talked about wanting to do more stuff, you know, and uh, and I'll be behind him, you know, um, to help him, you know, and any way I can. Um, it's usually one of those things I think with kids when they when they get to sort of like teenage years, that's generally when it kicks in when you know your your desire to sort of like play more, I think. Um, but it's great, you know, that he's that he's into it, and um, I spoke to him yesterday, and uh, and. He was, you know, he's, he's playing and he's practicing, so you know that's that's the main thing. He's still sort of on with it. Um, he's got a couple of guitars, one in open tuning for slide and one in uh, in um, standard. So that's all good. That's all good. No, it's cool. Um, I even um, at Upton, uh, my got um, Emma, my girlfriend, got up and played on one track. She brought a resonator up, and for the same reason, you know, I just think that's a that's a great memory to have. Um, you know. Right then, so your musical style is very eclectic, a mix of blues, rock, rockabilly, soul, all put into the mixer to create an avalanche of sounds on stage. How would you describe your musical style? Well, that's always a tricky one. Um, you know, I've got all those... <laughs> I think you're, you're made up of what you've, you know, of the layers of music you... Um, you've listened to, you know, during your life, you know, um, so if you peel back all the layers, probably at the core, when I was about six, um, I was obsessed with Night at the Opera by Queen, I think my first single was Flash by Queen, uh, 1980, um, and uh, I used to just, yeah, you know, Night at the Opera, I just used to listen to that over and over as a kid, and uh, I used to love the production, I didn't know what it was production then, but I just used to love the sounds, you know, sort of, um, Things like Good Company, the way they EQ'd the, the guitar to sound like um, a New Orleans band and stuff like that. You know, I was really interested in that when I was a kid, when I was really young. Um, and I was a bit older, you know, sort of discovered sort of blues, Jimi Hendrix, um, Sun House, someone let me an album of, of his. Uh, but then the Beatles and all that kind of stuff that was all going on. And then it was all the sort of the American rock, like Aerosmith and all the LA sort of thing, like Van Halen. I remember. Back to the Future coming out and being blown away by the by those guys by Van Halen, which were featured in the film, and I looked for the cassettes after and stuff like that. Um, and I think Back to the Future was a sort of like a, a turning point in that film. I was about ten, about eighty five was it? Eighty five, so it might have been eleven. Um, up until that point, I wanted to play sax, I think, and um, and that, that sort of changed everything. Um, which I think it, it, you know, it did for a lot of people. I, I think I remember reading a John Mayer interview saying the same sort of thing. Um, 
so yeah, got a guitar at that, you know, at that age, and um, and started playing. Um, and yeah, so so I think stylistically, you know, all that's in there. So the high energy sort of thing, I've always been attracted to. Energy and music has been my sort of thing, really. I, you know, I'm not particularly. I wouldn't say my music's heavy, but I would say it's got a lot of energy in it. Um, so if you put us, my band, up and up to, you know side by side or like on the same bill as a metal band we're not in the, you know we're not like they were not heavy but we're the set's usually quite brutal in the way that it's delivered with energy um and uh, i like to i like to see that i want i really want to sort of play like i'd like to see you know like something i'd like to see myself so you know and, and um so i think yeah the energy thing's a, a big thing but so there's blues <coughs> in there uh, Johnny Hooker is definitely a sort of like a big feature of, of what I do. Um, not so much as stylistically where I've learnt his songs because um, when I was growing up, I was not really into sort of learning. Uh, the, the guitar was always a vehicle for writing. You know, I always wanted to do to write. So, you know, I've, I've obviously learnt songs over the years, but um, I'm not the sort of person who would learn Stevie Ray Vaughan licks and all that kind of thing. You know, um, because I've seen so many people, you know, do that, and then they, when they play live, they regurgitate Steve Ray Vaughan licks, and uh, it's fine, you know, and, and some people might like that, but you want to try and have some kind of voice on the instrument, I think. You need to have something that's yours, and the more stylistically, if you learn other people's stuff, you know, um, that can dilute anything that, uh, of yourself um, that's in there, I think. I know that people disagree with that, but um, so yeah, so so John, the Johnny Hooker vibe, and that's probably when people think that I'm playing rockabilly, the boogie sort of thing, that kind of like the you know that that that's more Johnny Hooker than rockabilly, I think. But what uh, it's probably the production when I when I put a track together, if I put slap back delay on the guitar. That's going to give it more of that rockabilly vibe. So that that boogie, you know, it's, it's shared, I suppose, across different genres. But um, so yeah, um, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, guitar music. You know, when I was a kid, I was listening to sort of like said Jimi Hendrix. But I was also listening to sort of like Satriani and Vi and all those guys. So I was always interested in that sort of stuff, you know, because I, I found it interesting. And again, these are people who were kind of non-genre specific. They, you know, they were obviously lent towards rock, but they kind of. Um, they were doing interesting things with um, with scales and um, you know melodies. It was when I was about sixteen, I was interested in sort of understanding what was going on with that, and um, that led me to sort of want to understand the, the music really, not so much guitar, but just kind of understand intervals and um, and scales. And if you wanted to sort of you know if you wanted to sound sort of Eastern, you know you, you, to understand that the Scale, if you flatten that second note, so things like that, so you could understand how to, in an improvisational situation, um, give across a certain flavor or mood, or you know, um, without necessarily learn, learning people's licks and styles, but still understanding what, what those things are. So, it's more the makeup of music, isn't it? You know, the, the theory of music, I was, you know. I was interested in really um so yeah so so uh, so yeah there's the rock thing i think it's you're a sum of your parts aren't you um so there's blues in there there's definitely rock in there i'm a big frank zappa fan which doesn't generally come out in this kind of uh, the sort of music i play but um if you go into band camp um God, maybe seven or eight years ago i recorded a thing called and the gods came down which is kind of like slightly proggier with time signature stuff because I've always been fascinated with you know sort of like interesting time signatures and stuff like that um so if you're interested in checking any of that sort of stuff out there's, there's an album on band camp and there's a few other things up there um I've put um kind of my back catalogue up um I did an album called Backdoor Hoodoo which got released through Blues Boulevard Records and what that album was was a collection of stuff off some digital releases that I put out so I decided when this lockdown happened to put those original albums up in the you know original format so those things are up there so you know head on over to pan camp and have, you, know, you can just listen to them uh, before you buy them so just you know, go check them out 
Right. If you could share the stage with any any band, alive or dead, who would it be and why? It's really tricky, and I should have looked at these questions first and sort of thought of something. Um, um, showing a band, uh, showing a stage of the band. Um, like, you know, one of my favourite sort of guys is, is Zappa. You know, um, would probably be the worst person to sort of share a stage with. You know, the most intimidating person, person to share a stage with. Stage with. Um, it depends if it was one of his improvisational solos and uh, you got to jam along with that. I'm sure that would be amazing because you, his rhythm section, his bands were just off the scale good. Uh, so that would be um, that would be pretty special. Um, yeah, so I'd say I'd say Zappa, but um, and he's, I wouldn't like to do his uh, his written parts. <laughs> uh, right. Name one song that really resonates with your very soul. Uh, there's one song that I keep coming back to. I've played it for years and years, and. Um, So if it resonates, but it's a song that you know that I absolutely love to play, which is John the Revelator by Sunhouse. Um, and Dark was the night, cold was the ground by Blind Willie Johnson. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. It, you know, there's lots of songs that uh, that I love. Um, uh, another one I would say is uh, Watermelons in Easter Hay by Frank Zappa. That's uh, absolutely gorgeous um, guitar piece, and that resonates. Um, Sean Costello's "Going Home to Live with God" is another one that I've, that's pretty powerful and uh, um, touches me. There's there's, there's lots. Um, uh, you did ask for one song. Well, sorry, I gave you a couple, but if I had to pick, yeah, one of those. Um, right, tea or coffee? Well, coffee, one hundred percent. Beer, whiskey, or tequila? Um, I'd probably go with beer. Um, although when I was in uh, in Russia with Boris the Blade, and when I was doing um, a run of dates over there with him, um, that was mainly vodka and a lot of it. Uh, uh, what else? Car or motorcycle? Um, for practicality, I'd say a car, but um, obviously uh, motorcycles are the way forward. Uh, hat or no hat? That's a silly question. Well. <laughs> um, What's the first thing you'll be doing once lockdown and restrictions are lifted? <clears throat> well, gigging, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, that, that's the uh, that's the thing I'm you know I'm missing most. Um, you know, yeah, I'm sure getting back out on the road is is the thing that um, I'll be I'll be looking to do. Um, so yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank Will again for, uh, for letting me do this interview. I hope you guys haven't been uh, bored silly by it. And I'll leave you guys with, uh, with something I mentioned before. It's uh, Sunhouse, John the Revelator.